everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is going to be on immunology, specifically the immune system. I will do a second round of videos on things like monoclonal antibodies, vaccines, HIV, sort of the separate stuff for immunology in the A-level specifications. But for now, I'm just going to focus on the immune system. So today's video is for AQA A-level, including AS level biology as well. So the first set of specification points that all AQA, AS and A-level uh, candidates need to know is that each type of cell has specific molecules on its surface that identify it. These molecules include proteins and enable the immune system to identify pathogens, cells from other organisms of the same species, abnormal body cells and toxins. And then you need to know the definition of an antigen and the effect of antigen variability on disease and disease prevention. And then you need to know about phagocytosis of pathogens and the subsequent destruction of ingested pathogens by lysozymes. So each type of cell is identified by a specific molecule, and this is known as an antigen. So an antigen is a specific protein molecule on a surface. Uh, on the surface of the cell. So when a pathogen invades, a pathogen has a specific antigen which is unique to it. So the body can identify and the immune system can identify this pathogen as an invading pathogen. So as I mentioned, the molecule, so the antigen, um, enables the immune system to identify pathogens and it can also identify cells from other organisms of the same species. Um, so, for example, if you kiss your partner and cells from their mouth goes into yours, the body identifies them as, as cells from the same species. And then also abnormal body cells, so body cells that have perhaps been destroyed by a virus. So the body knows that they need to destroy that body cell and create new ones that are not abnormal, that are normal, that are working. And also um, it can help to identify toxins. So I'm briefly just going to go over what a pathogen is. So a pathogen is a disease causing virus, bacteria, fungi or protists, which can infect animals and plants. So pathogens make you feel ill by damaging cells or by altering how they work. So bacteria are small living prokaryotic cells. So they're much smaller than human cells. They're only one out of 100 size of body cells. These reproduce rapidly and they cause illness by invading and destroying body cells and also by releasing toxins. Then we've got viruses. So these aren't classed as alive, but they cause illness by infecting the host cell and replicating the DNA and protein coats. And then this is what causes cells to make toxins and also causes cell damage due to the virus release from the cell. Then fungi, so these are eukaryotic, they can be single or multi-celled, and not all fungi are pathogens. And then protists, so these are eukaryotic as well, and many are free living, but some are pathogens. So an antigen is part of an organism or a substance which is recognised as foreign by the immune system. So an antigen is the part of the pathogen that activates the primary immune response. So when you're infected for a second time with the same pathogen, with the same antigens on its surface, this activates the secondary response and usually results in no symptoms and no illness. So antigen variability, also known as antigenic variation, is when pathogens mutate frequently and hence these antigens can change suddenly. So the consequences of antigens changing is that these new antigens are not recognised by the memory lymphocytes, the memory cells produced from the first infection. So this means that the immune system has to carry out another primary response against the new antigens and has to produce new antibodies specific to these antigens. So because this takes time, you then get ill again. So unfortunately, this means that vaccines can become ineffective because the new and new ones are difficult to develop due to this antigenic variation. So the reason vaccines become ineffective is because of the new antigens. So antigenic drift is mutations that occur over time, resulting in a virus with differing antigenic properties. So as you can see here, we've got um, a virus, for example, with blue um, antigens here, but then they've changed to purple ones here. So this is due to the mutation occurring over time, and this therefore results in different antigenic properties. So this takes more time, this is less severe. 
However, antigenic shift is when virus strains combine to form a new subtype, which is a mixture of antigens. So we've got a, a virus here and then we've got a second virus and these combine to make a com completely new mixture of antigens. So this is more drastic. So an example of antigen variability in practice is with the influenza virus. So the flu vaccine has to change every year because the antigens on the influenza virus change and this produces new strains. So the previous memory cells that have been produced now don't recognize the new antigens and the strains are immunologically distinct. So therefore new vaccine has to be developed and then the one that is most effective is chosen. So different flu virus strains also require different vaccines. So health authorities and governments implement uh, an appropriate vaccination program for that year. So white blood cells are key components of the immune system and they have three defense roles against pathogens. So one is engulfing them and this is known as phagocytosis. The second is producing antibodies and the third is producing antitoxins. So there's two main types of white blood cells. So these are phagocytes which uh, include macrophages and neutrophils and then there's lymphocytes which are T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes also known as T cells and B cells. So the process of phagocytosis involves macrophages and neutrophils, which are phagocytes, and these engulf foreign cells and digest them. So the first step is the phagocyte leaving the blood, and this occurs by it squeezing through capillaries and entering tissues that are being attacked by pathogens. So the damaged cells and the pathogens release chemicals which attract the phagocyte to the site of infection. And then the phagocyte releases the cytoplasm around the pathogen and receptors attach onto the chemicals of the pathogen's surface. So then the pathogen is enclosed inside of the white blood cell in a vacuole and this creates a phagosome. So within phagocytes there are lysosomes and these contain enzymes called lysozymes. So lysozymes are hydrolytic enzymes that hydrolyze pathogens. So once the uh, pathogen has been um, surrounded by the cytoplasm and held within a vacuole and then in a phagosome, the lysozyme fuses with this phagosome and this exposes the pathogen to the lysozyme, so to this hydrolytic, hydrolytic enzyme. Then the lysozyme hydrolyzes the pathogen and also any soluble uh, molecules which are useful are absorbed into the phagocyte's cytoplasm. So phagocytes then present the antigen of the digested pathogen on their surface and the phagocyte is now called an antigen presenting cell. And I've just uh, created a little phagocytosis summary here which you'll see on my Instagram as well and this sort of just summarizes the process as you can see. So the next set of points you need to know is the response of T lymphocytes to a foreign antigen, which is known as the cellular or the cell mediated response. You need to know the role of antigen presenting cells in the cellular response and the role of helper T cells, TH cells, in stimulating cytotoxic T cells, TC cells, B cells and phagocytes. The role of other T cells is not required to be known, so it's just these ones you need to focus on. You also need to know the response of B lymphocytes to a foreign antigen, including clonal selection and the release of monoclonal antibodies, which is the humoral response. So you need to know the definition of an antibody, the antibody structure, the formation of an antigen antibody complex, which leads to the destruction of the antigen, limited to agglutination and phagocytosis of bacterial cells. And then you also need to know the roles of plasma cells and of memory cells in producing primary and secondary immune responses. So B and T lymphocytes, also known as B and T cells, so I've created a little summary table here. So B, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes are both created by bone marrow stem cells. The key difference, however, is that B lymphocytes mature in the bone marrow, hence they're called B cells, so bone marrow B cells. But T lymphocytes mature in the thymus, hence they're called T cells. So B lymphocytes are um, involved in the humoral response and T lymphocytes are involved in the cellular or the cell mediated response. So B lymphocytes or B cells, uh, the clones of these differentiate into memory and plasma B cells and T lymphocytes uh, differentiate into memory, cytotoxic and also helper T cells. And then I've put uh, two little diagrams on the bottom here, and these are what are going to be used in the rest of the presentation to um, 
refer to B and T lymphocytes. So the cellular or the cell mediated response is the response of T cells to a foreign antigen. So this begins with receptors on T cells binding onto the antigen of antigen presenting cells. This then causes T cells to divide rapidly by mitosis and this is a process called clonal expansion. So these cloned T cells then differentiate into different specialized T cells. So these specialized T cells include memory T cells, which enable the rapid immune response when infection with the same pathogen occurs again. And cytotoxic T cells, so these are used to kill abnormal cells as well as infected body cells. So they do this by releasing a protein called perforin, and this creates pores in the cell membrane, allowing all substances to move into the cell. And this is ultimately what causes cell death. And then finally, we've got helper T cells. So these stimulate the B cells to divide and to secrete antibodies. So the humoral response is the response of B cells to a foreign antigen. So here we've got an antigen presenting B cell and we've got a helper T cell. So these both stimulate and initiate the humoral response. And this is what causes B cells to be cloned via mitosis. And this is also called clonal expansion. So these differentiate then into memory B cells and into plasma cells. So plasma cells are responsible for producing the antibodies which are specific in shape to the antigen that initiated the initial immune response. And then memory B cells produce a large number of antibodies if the individual is infected by the same pathogen again. So this is how long term immunity is sustained by B cells. So you need to know the structure of antibodies. So they are proteins which have four polypeptide chains, so two heavy chains and two light chains. They have a constant region and they also have a variable region. And the variable region includes the binding site, which is complementary to the antigen. So it's called the variable region because it changes for each antigen. So the antigen binds to the antibody and this is called an antigen antibody complex. So here you can see a diagram of an antibody that I've created. So we've got the two heavy chains at the bottom. So this one and this one. And then we've got our two light chains, which are these two chains here and here. And then we've got our antigen binding sites at the top here. We've also got disulfide bonds. So here, here and here, which uh, hold all the chains together and then the constant region is the area in blue and the variable region is the region in purple. So the ultimate role of, of antibodies is to destroy pathogens. So they do this by agglutination, which is clumping bacterial cells together so that phagocytes can locate and engulf them. And they also do this by acting as markers. So this stimulates phagocytes to engulf the cell. So the primary response is the first exposure to the pathogen. So this involves plasma cells creating complementary antibodies. Now, because this is the first exposure, this takes time, which means the individual is very likely to suffer symptoms before the pathogen is destroyed. The secondary response is when an individual is reinfected by the same pathogen, so the second exposure. So memory cells are able to produce large numbers of complementary antibodies rapidly because they already remember this same pathogen and the antigens on it. So this means the pathogen is destroyed before any symptoms are produced. So this is known as natural active immunity. And here we can see a graph. So we've got our first exposure at this point here. So the concentration of antibodies is low because it's the first exposure. And then as time goes on, the primary immune response hits in here and uh, the concentration of antibodies increases as, as the uh, lymphocytes produce the antibodies. So then time goes on and the individual may have second exposure. And as you can see, a secondary immune response causes the concentration of antibodies to increase rapidly and much more than in the primary immune response. And this is because the memory cells are able to remember which antibodies produce and are able to produce a high concentration rapidly. So now we're going to move on to some questions based on that information. So question one, describe how phagocytosis of a pathogen leads to presentation of its antigens. So we know that a phagosome is produced once the pathogen is taken inside of the phagocyte. 
So the phagosome then fuses with a lysosome, which allows the pathogen to be exposed to lysozymes, which are hydrolytic enzy enzymes, and then the lysozymes can destroy the pathogen. And then the antigen from the pathogen is displayed on the cell membrane of the phagocyte. And we can see our answers here. Question two, describe how presentation of a pathogen's antigen leads to production of antibodies. And this is worth three marks. So we know that a helper T cell actually binds to the antigen on the antigen presenting cell. And then it's the helper T cell which stimulates this specific B cell. And this stimulation causes B cells to clone or to divide by mitosis. So you could also say to link those two sentences together that a T helper cell stimulates B cell to undergo clonal selection. And then the B cell clones differentiate into plasma cells and it's these plasma cells which release antibodies. And you can see our answer there. Question three, autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis involve an individual's immune system attacking their own body cells. There is a virus that produces a protein very similar to a human protein called collagen. Suggest how an individual can develop rheumatoid arthritis if affected by this viral protein. And this is worth two marks. So it says in the question that this virus produces a protein which is very similar to a human protein. So this therefore indicates that the immune system is going to be confused and it's going to accidentally uh, bind to collagen, the human protein, if this virus infects. So an antibody is going to be produced, which is specific to the viral antigen, and this antibody may accidentally bind to collagen instead of the protein produced by vi the virus. So this is obviously then going to cause destruction of the human protein collagen and of human body cells. And we can see our answer here. Question four, a vaccination often involves injecting a small amount of attenuated pathogen into the body. Use your knowledge of the humoral immune response to explain how this causes the individual to become immune to the pathogen. So we know that the humoral immune response involves T helper cells or antigen presenting B cells stimulating B cells specific to the pathogen and causing them to therefore replicate by mitosis or undergo clonal expansion. Then the B cell clones differentiate into plasma cells and B memory cells. And if the individual is infected by the pathogen, the secondary immune response occurs and B memory cells produce a high concentration of antibodies rapidly. And you can see our answer here. Question five, metastatic melanoma, a type of skin cancer, is caused by a faulty receptor protein in cell surface membranes. Suggest so why the human immune system can destroy metastatic melanoma tumor cells, and this is worth three marks. So the faulty receptor protein uh, is evidently identified by the immune system as a foreign antigen. They believe it to be a foreign cell or protein. So then T cells bind to this faulty protein thinking that it's a foreign antigen. And then helper T cells stimulate the B cells, which causes them to undergo clonal selection. So then of course they differentiate into plasma cells and these plasma cells release antibodies against the foreign protein, which is actually the faulty receptor protein. And you can see our answer here. So thank you so much for watching my video. Please give it a big thumbs up if you have enjoyed and make sure to subscribe, share and comment down below any video requests or questions you may have. Also make sure to follow my social media and head over to my website to access lots of exam questions and resources. And I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.